Hi everyone, uh, I'm Caroline Sanders. This is my talk, I blank what I blank. Oh, sorry. Uh, so I'm a machine learning designer. For the past year and a half, I was a user researcher at IBM Watson where I worked on natural language processing and chatbot software. I actually don't do that anymore of last week. I'm a BuzzFeed IBM fellow where I'll be spending the next year prototyping anti-harassment machine learning systems. So I know that's a lot, it's a lot to say. Um, but the way I like to think of what I do is I study online fandoms, communities, and internet culture and online harassment. And I've been doing that for the past five years. And I've been specifically focusing on Gamergate for the past two. I have a master's from the Interactive Telecommunications Program at NYU where I worked with Clay Shirky studying political uses of social media and HCI. And I like to think about complex motions and language and emotional reactions within systems. And the reason I focus on online harassment and social media is social media is the way in which we communicate so many of these complex conversations in the outside world, and we're creating varying levels and kinds of communication within that, meaning like semi-private to very private to public conversations. They're being sort of caught and captured by different kinds of companies, and it's very different from any kind of historical telecommunications that we've had. Um, so how many of you know what Gamergate is? All right, cool. So I don't really have to explain it. But I will. Gamergate is both a political, <laughs> both a political activist group and a harassment group depending upon who you ask. Meaning if you ask a victim of Gamergate, it's a harassment group. And if you ask Gamergate themselves, they view themselves as political activists trying to save a particular idea of games. I think that's really important. Gamergate is in fact a harassment campaign and a harassment group. But the way in which the participants inside that group define themselves is incredibly important, especially if we start to think about passing any kind of policy or rules inside of these unregulated private company spaces. Um, so for the past two years, I did something really crazy where I audited uh, all of Gamergate's social media. I looked at Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, 4chan, 8chan, and Reddit. And I interviewed over 40 people affected by Gamergate as well as talking to Gamergate participants themselves. Why would I do that? <laughs> Because I find human communication really fascinating. And what I noticed from my research is a lot of the communication styles Gamergate um, were using were actually more intrinsic to platforms like Reddit, which is a board-based communication style. And it's a more active communication style. If you post on Reddit, you're actually like, leaning towards communication. You want people to respond. But they took that kind of communication style and apply it to every other communication system that existed, like Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Twitter, for example, is a bit more passive. It's a bit more neutral. You can post with the inkling of wanting people to respond, but the idea is it's usually people you're following or people that are in your network, even though it's a completely open network if you're public. But Gamergate took this idea that if you're public, you must want to talk, you must want to talk to people you don't know, which is not actually the way Twitter was designed. And I started to think about this as a designer. So when I said I'm a machine learning designer, what that means is I actually take really complex notions around machine learning, which can be a bit of a black box if you don't have a background in that. And I try to distill that through design in a way that feels transparent and open to users, meaning I take these complex scenarios and situations and I try to make them easily uh, understandable and digestible to a variety of different kinds of users. And so the one thing that really guides my practice is this idea of what does a transparent system look like? Machine learning, like social media, is not transparent. And design can really obfuscate what those systems do. So for example, I think of Twitter as a highly regulated space. It's not regulated by policy, it's regulated by design. And well, it's not regulated by legal policy, it's regulated by policy of the system itself, right? It's regulated by policy inside this private company that's publicly traded. And it's a company that doesn't actually sort of give a really great roadmap to how you can reach someone, what it looks like to troubleshoot a problem inside of Twitter, um, or how if you report something, where you sit in a queue. So it's not a transparent system, it has false transparencies. And so for the past year, I decided I wanted to create a series of uh, different kinds of design interventions to start exploring the ways in which our communication exists inside these systems and how I could potentially fix it as a designer. So I made a performance art piece. <laughs> it's called Social Media Breakup Coordinator. Uh, I hand wrote out um, a quiz that then algorithmically generated results that I then spoke to people about. I wanted to see if people would hire me to be an emotional mechanical Turk to solve their problems, and I was interested to see what problems existed. So I'd already spent a lot of my time looking at the problems that came out of Gamergate, which is things like doxing, the release of public documents, mob harassment, meaning many versus one, uh, dog piling, again, another many versus one, a bunch of users jumping upon another user, and the user has to then remove themselves from the system. But I wanted to see um, what other kinds of emotional trauma exist inside these systems that had nothing to do with uh, specific kinds of harassment like Gamergate. 
So I turned an art gallery into a doctor's office, I charged $15 for 15 minutes, and I gave people advice about social media. And people thought it was real. <laughs> Trying to explain this to the press is really fantastic because I actually had a legally binding contract people signed which said I'm not a therapist and this is really just a recommendation. Um, so trying to explain this project to the press, which is I was giving thoughtful, nuanced feedback that came from the research I was doing. Um, people signed a legally binding contract and they charged me money. And so the press was like, but it's not real. No, this is not a job, but I'm being paid. <laughs> but I was really interested in this idea to sort of see what problems users had and, what, and how they related to their privacy settings. So a big component of my research was this idea that design and conversation, the main problem around, those, um, around that uh, conversation side digital spaces is that there's a lack of transparency around privacy settings. That harassment actually may be a security problem. And it's a security problem because users lack an ability to be able to decide how reachable they are at different times. I like to call this, how do you be semi-private in a public network? So this led to this wireframe, which I'm now building with a Google engineer to turn into a Chrome extension. And this came specifically out of my research. And the reason I did the performance art piece is I wanted to see if any of these settings could also be applied to things like work, like work problems or friendship breakups or even romantic breakups. Um, these particular settings came out of my Gamergate research and then I tested them with uh, the data I collected from my performance art piece and realized that this would work for a variety of problems. What this does is it takes um, it takes the idea of conversation inside of these big spaces and tries to break it down into different kinds of conversations that actually mimic the conversations we have offline. I think that there are around four different kinds of conversations. There's the town hall, which is this scenario, where I can see most of you, but we're live streaming it, so I actually don't have any idea of how amplified my voice is or how often, how reachable I am. There's the front porch, which is um, like probably more actually reflective of this if the live stream wasn't happening, meaning I can see most people, but there could be people coming in and out in very, in, in very incremental spaces. Then there's a living room, which is the semi-private um, in a public space. It's closed off, you can see people, but you're having much more private conversations. And then there's the bedroom, which is the most intimate, most, most private. So these settings try to break down the different kinds of ways, uh, or try to actually take all those complexities and put them into something that was really understandable a UX UI uh, security setting. So these say a variety of things from allow followers of followers to tweet at you, this idea that like the circle of friends is a safe space, don't allow accounts with less than a certain amount of followers to tweet at you, or don't allow accounts with a certain, uh, less than a certain amount of months to tweet at you. Those two come specifically out of Gamergate um, during harassment campaigns. If a user blocked a harasser, the harasser would make a brand new account immediately to continue the harassment. This is a really easy way to quality filter that out. And the one thing I noticed in particular was this emotional negotiation users would have in these settings or times of need when they were being harassed that um, they would have this emotional negotiation of making their accounts private. And that's one of the most public things you can do during a harassment campaign is take your public account and make it private. It's a massive design shift. It's really easy to see. So I find that to be really fascinating that the way in which to have uh, privacy and anonymity in a public system is actually a very public step. So this was something where it takes your settings, and it takes all the affordances of privacy, but you still look public. And again, even something as basic as this, trying to imagine the ways in which certain conversations want to be public and some want to be private inside of this social network. Um, so I mentioned I have a fellowship, and a lot of it is going to be focusing on what is the future of social media, and how can we create sort of open source initiatives around social online communication, and, and how do we create these spaces to be non-regulated. Um, I've been working a lot with very uh, different groups, some of which are US uh, Congresswomen and Senators, and some are just um, higher up into the chain of command inside of social networks. And the, one ki the different kinds of conversations I keep hearing over and over again are how do we solve this problem? How do we make people empathize more? How do we create better rules? And I've, I feel like the, actually one of the bigger problems around that is what happens if we start to create more regulation, even from like a legal and policy standpoint to combat harassment, what does that do to freedom of speech? So I'm going to spend the next year prototyping and creating all open source design research and uh, many social networks around that um, through a BuzzFeed and IBM fellowship I have. So this is the only bit of the hardware talk. I'm creating a small social network that is a co-op, so every member of the network owns it, and it's built on Raspberry Pi. I'm building that with Dan Pfeiffer. Um, this is another project called Selfie, which is exploring 
all different ways in which surveillance exists inside of our um, outside lives. And then I created this uh, video game called Dark Patterns from speaking to the legal, um, speaking to the legal counsel for WikiLeaks and Matthew Keys. What would regu a regulated web look like and what would it look like inside of your own home and inside of your own browser? So it's a video game where you're just exploring that. And this is what the background looks like. I know this seems like a lot, but I often think about design as this very, it being a very political tool because it's political as code and policy because it takes this it takes these complexities that exist inside of code and takes the complexities that are formed by policy and distills it into a thing that people can see and I think I think a lot of our design of the web is broken in that sense and I'm worried that because it's so broken we're going to create all these extra ways to fix it that aren't actually fixing it it's just simply regulating the space I think things like online harassment are in fact design problems and I think about design being this equalizing force that allows the common user, the average user, to start to understand what's happening underneath the hood. We can't actually open up the hood of Twitter and see what's happening. If we can't open it, we can't own it. And so I've been thinking a lot about the ways in which if we're going to start fixing these initiatives, how those initiatives need to be open sourced and shared with the public. And that's what I'm going to be doing for the next year. Because I wonder about this a lot. Who gets to design how and where we talk, and why can't we talk back? If you're designing alone but for the community, you're actually not designing for the community at all. You're designing for yourself. Thank you. I think we have like three minutes for questions, if anyone has any. Oh, or one minute. Anyone? Small data. <laughs> um, but if you're interested in that, feel free to reach out to me. We're always looking for participants. Um, and if you're interested in any of these projects, um, feel free to follow me on Twitter, check out my GitHub. Along every step of the way, I'll be writing and sharing everything that I'm doing. I think that's, I think that's it.